All right. Welcome back to Resilient Voices and Beyond. This is episode 14. It's been a long time coming. I just want to take the time as we get ready to start off this episode to really show my gratitude and thank you guys for the support. You know, you guys have done rallying behind the Resilient Voices and Beyond podcast, but also like the initiative and the coffees and conversations and so forth. I wouldn't be able to do this and um, continue this work without you guys so thank you so much for you guys that may just this may be your first episode you know <laughs> chiming in my name is michael d davis thomas aka mddt speaks it is my initials you know because i have somebody ask me you know what does mddt stands for i was you know it's my initials you know so it kind of sounds like a wrestling move you know somebody hit him with the mddt you know <laughs> but no um that's you know who i am i've Spent a little bit over 11 years in the Michigan Health Welfare System. Um, been advocating for a number of years. Done a lot of stuff in the child welfare um, arena. And I'm here today to just do my part to bring forth a platform to help individuals share their story, share their experience, and hopes of, for them, some people coming on here, it may be healing. You know, some people coming on here, it may help them be able to, you know, trace those steps. But in other words, outside of the people just coming on here, it may be educational for the audience, you know, and so forth. So I'm just here to have this platform and um, navigate these conversations with you guys as an audience and um, the individual guests, you know, in hopes that it may mend or build some bridges or, you know, help us, you know, get to the right path and child welfare. Let's go. So, without further ado, you know, you guys know I can talk, you know, I'm going to have you guys listen to the guest that I have on. He's going to introduce himself. You know, I'm so excited. Man, my name is Jared Vermillion. Um, I am a former consumer of multiple services. I have grown in, in, into my maturity to being able to advise states, counties, uh, international speaking with, with how it comes to support children and families in their desperate Um, I've been able to support, you know, imp implementations of different practices to meet the unique needs of complex children and families with their unique needs, both culturally, individualized, and supporting them in ways that, you know, traditional services don't just meet. And um, I, I, I grew up in the system. My dad caused the fatal crash of the, uh, my dad caused a fatal crash that took the lives of two people when I was 10 years old. He was drunk driving and uh, he, he, it was his third DUI and he took the lives of two children. Um, and then after that, uh, my mother, my mother went into rehab and I was birthed into the system, both mental health and child welfare services. And um, I've grown to mature and understand the calling of which, you know, was bestowed upon me to make a difference in our systems. And I'm just so glad to be here today. I uh, support the implementation of wraparound practice across the nation, doing something different. I call them SEAL Team Human Services, people that support children and families in the other, other mental health services, right? Whatever you need, we're going to make it happen. And um, so I'm so glad to join you today. Um, uh, I'm in my late thirties. I hate to say it, you know, I got a couple grays here and uh, I've learned a lot about our systems of care and how we can help children and families. And I've also learned how the family youth and voice can be the ultimate, you know, factor that makes a difference for children and families. So Michael, thank you for having me. And a little bit about me. I also did a TED Talk. If you want to check it out, um, superheroes heal superheroes. And um, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Michael. No problem. No problem. And we're going to get into more of what you just shared. But, you know, um, on to building this timeline of your experience, you kind of touched on it a little bit more. But I'm, I'm just ask if you could dive in a little bit deeper with us, you know, so we can better understand you and your experience. Um, how did your experience in care begin? Yeah, so I was a, a child of extreme poverty. I mean, we had a hole in our trailer park in the roof that some people call a skylight. That's where the cats came in. The cats mm -hmm. came in through that hole 
they uh, they took over our house. Um, we had no food. We had, you know, all the, uh, the, the, the normal teas of what most people have, we didn't have. My mom was experiencing method, meth addiction. My father was a severe alcoholic. And um, we grew up every day in poverty. You know, I would go to school wearing shoes two sizes too bigger for me because they were cheaper at Ross. And um, uh, the, the, the systems that are supportive, we were in a rural community where the community, the, the formal systems didn't necessarily reach our community. And so uh, we didn't get the supports and the resources necessary to help us out. And um, I grew up a, AKA in the hood, you know, like um, I was uh, involved in child welfare services. My, my dad went to prison and my mom went to rehab. I was placed with my auntie. Uh, I, after a short stay of juvenile probation, I was in Jamison Center, which is in uh, juvenile hall because they didn't know where to put me. So I was put there for a short period of time. My siblings were separated. My sister was put with my grandma. My brother was put with his grandma and I was placed with my auntie. And um, we navigated life on life's terms given the circumstances. And uh, I was that one kid that did, they called me the preacher's kid. They called me because I could have gone down the left road, right? And uh, involved in criminal behavior and um, you know, kind of rebuck the system. But instead, I chose to embrace the circumstances of which I was a part of. My mom always said I was going to be a preacher, um, and I'm a different kind of preacher. I, I, I preach child welfare services, and, um, you know, we've experienced poverty. We've experienced criminal injustice, cultural injustices. Um, we've experienced, you know, what it means to be like a child who every, every Saturday, my grandma, who had no money at all, took us to go visit my dad, no matter what prison he was at. He was in almost every prison in the state of California, and uh, she found a way to make it happen, and that found a way to, to, you know, to to grow who I was, and to make somebody who, you know, comes back to make a change in the system. And uh, I'll just kind of leave it th leave it at that. I, I experienced mental health, you know, concerns. Um, I have multiple diagnoses. Uh, they don't define who I am. Um, I'm I'm much more than my mental health diagnoses. And I'm so glad to be here today. So a little bit about my, my backstory, poverty, extreme child welfare, abuse and neglect. Um, my father was incarcerated. My mother was incarcerated. And uh, I was placed with my auntie. And, and she allowed me for me to have, I don't know, this, this self-expression to be able to move on and do things that most kids aren't able to do. So it's kind of like a little bit of background of what I've been through. Um, and uh, I was fortunate not to be placed after home after home. And I know a lot of children and youth go through multiple homes, multiple placements. And I was fortunate to have an auntie that just kind of just allowed me to be who I was and supported me at, 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 at developing the skills and knowledge and, and kind of life lifestyle that I, I you know, that came, to, came upon me. Um, I was influenced by my band teacher who never gave up on me. I was influenced by a mayor who took an interest in me and allowed me some different, uh, it, who would have been, uh, you know, suspended, expelled when I attempted to make some choices to protect others and instead saw the circumstances of my life and instead did some things recognizing trauma and supported me in my growth. So uh, I'm just kind of one of those youth that have experienced the positive, you know, attributes of our system that have made us to allow for, to be able to, you know, employ voice and choice and make change on all levels. So thank you, Michael. Awesome. Awesome. Um, you, you dropped a lot of nuggets there. You dropped yeah, a buddy. lot of nuggets. I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm going to travel a little bit back, which back, you know, because you dropped a lot, you know, and I want to break some of this down a little bit. Um, the first initial experience going into care was um, your father, um and the accident you know um prior to that experience because of location there was no real alerts you know on the onset different things that was going on your father's drinking the substance use and so forth so prior to all of that you know if it wasn't for the accident you know you probably would have still been in that environment due to location of things you know who knows you know um so my question to you um because we 
when we think about different things and stuff like that, you know, um, we don't know really our reality may be formed towards something until something traumatic happens right. where someone tells us like, you weren't supposed to be in this environment. Do you recollect back to that moment, you know, a realization that mom was doing drugs, you know, dad had, you know, alcohol problems, you know, and so forth. And my life wasn't normal. This is this is not what everybody goes through. Do you remember that moment when you realized that? Or how did that realization come apart for you? You know, uh, so I remember the day my dad caused his fatal car crash. And um, I, we were set. So I, my mom told me that if I, they got divorced at a very young age, substance abuse, domestic violence. Um, my mom got into a new relationship that was also included in domestic violence. And my stepdad, you know, he was a very abusive, neglectful person. And um, I remember we, so my room was in our trailer park. Mm -hmm. I lived in the sunroom. And so that was a room that was, you know, uh, the outside room, the, the neighborhoods, you know, so it didn't have air conditioning. It didn't have, you know, the, the normal means of household, you know, uh, uh, comedies. And um, I remember there was, there were, you know, I grew up, uh, kids used to clown me because of the shoes I wear. Kids, uh, they were my, I used to wear my grandpa's clothes because they were passed on. And um, I remember the circumstance in which my dad went to prison. We were set up. We were supposed to go spend the whole summer with my dad. And my mom told me if I got grades, if I did good enough that I could spend the whole day, the whole summer with my father. Well, guess what? I got them C's. I got them C's. And we were set to go, you know, spend the summer with my father. And for whatever reason, my dad was experiencing, you know, severe stress and he chose to drink. And then I remember getting a phone call. I remember hearing my mom scream that my dad had committed the ultimate heinous crime. And he had been in an accident and, and, um, and, and this, this accident was so severe that it took the lives of two people and that he was in the ICU and I was 10 years old. I mean, think about that. 10, most 10 years old, you know, they, they're doing boys, girls clubs, they're involved in their activities, they work focused on their grades. But for me, I had to focus on higher things like family stability. And I remember how much that hit me. And um, my family comes from severe poverty, severe criminal behavior severe obesity. And uh, I remember trying to manage that in the ways that I knew how, but uh, the, the, the outcome was that there was nothing I could do. You know, I remember getting the phone calls every Thursday of my dad, dad from prison. My grandmother, who, who couldn't afford it, no way, because you know it costs $20 for every phone call, uh, would find ways to make to my dad be able to call us. And every Thursday at four o'clock, we'd meet at grandma's house. And she would, my dad would call us from prison and our calls were interrupted every 30 seconds by, this is the, you know, corrections facility on a recorded line and da, 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 da. And, um, you know, I remember feeling like I was different than all other kids. Most kids had their parents show up to their ball games. I played football. I was in choir. I was in band. And I remember my parents would never show up. And it, you know, it, it took a toll on my soul, but I found ways to just continue showing up. I knew that there was something greater for me. I knew that there was a calling in this system. And, um, you know, regardless of the circumstances, my grandmother, I remember, uh, this is kind of a sad story, but my grandmother, when I was about 11 years old, slapped the, out of my mom and because my mom was gone on a five-day meth bench. And um, she didn't know what to do. And my grandmother slapped her because she just didn't know what to do. And my grandmother asked her, what are you doing to support these children? You know, regardless of your circumstance. And we were caught up in trauma. We didn't know how to respond. We had dogs being born from the puppies in our neighborhood. You know, my dogs were wild dogs. They ran the neighborhood. They weren't locked up in the backyard. Um, we lived in severe poverty. And I remember, you know, circumstances in which the puppies couldn't get fed. Because the mom was gotten a fight, gosh, I could just I, I could totally just explain to you the circumstances of the severe trauma that I was exposed to from abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, poverty. You know, we came from and, and although my skin shows one way, I like to be clear that, you know, we were we, we were clearly experiencing injustices of the system.
because it wasn't just me, it was the previous generations that have been involved in criminal, criminal injustices. You know, my uncles, my aunties, my grandparents, there was this gener generational knowledge that this family was just a screw up. And so it wasn't just my parents' incarceration, but it was also generational cycles that led me to people not believing, oh, you're just a vermilion. You're just gonna be a piece of, you know, garbage. And um, so I remember feeling hopeless. I remember at one point in my life going out and uh, running away. And the reason I ran away is because I felt like no one would come after me. Who would care? Who would show up? Who would look for me? I stole the, you know, the emblems off the car, off the Lincolns, off the Navigators. I'd steal the car, I'd steal the pieces off those cars. And I'd wonder if anyone was able to come out and search for me. And the reality is no one ever came. And we were in a small rural community that wasn't involved with social services. And um, that led toward, I, I guess, an opportunity for me to be successful. So there, I, you know, I could have gone left. I could have gone right. And for whatever reason, there were some, you know, like I said, the band teacher, the mayor, uh, my girlfriend, who stood up and said, you know what, you're better than that. And they held on even when I pushed against them that helped me uh, aspire to be who I am today. So I don't know if that answered your question, but the reality is, is I come from extreme poverty, extreme substance abuse. I remember our doors, the doors on my auntie's house, the doors on my house were all kicked in by the police. You know, so you could just walk in the house. There was no doors. And um, there were, you know, there were people using substances. There were people in the backyard doing things that were inappropriate. And for whatever reason, I just felt this calling to make a difference. I felt like I was going to be different. My grandmother said to me, if it is to be, it is up to me. And I took on this, uh, the, you know, this calling that I was going to be better than those that came before me. And uh, I don't know if that answered the question, Michael, but, uh, you know, just to describe the circumstances in which I grew up in, there were many times where the electric was cut off, the gas was cut off, you know, the water was cut off. And we used to get that, you know, little note on the door that said your, your water is going to be cut off in four days. And me and my sister, we would fill up 20 gallons buckets of water. We fill up the bathtub and we would do things so that we would have access to water even after the water was cut off. Electricity, we had a barbecue in the backyard. We had kerosene heaters. I grew up in extreme neglect. And, um, but we found ways to make it happen. That resilience just, you know, manifested itself in whatever we did. So I don't know if that kind of answers the question, but I just want to kind of share some of the circumstances of which I grew up in. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just processing, you know, and visualizing. I'm a very visual person. So as you're taking me through that experience, you know, just kind of visualizing, you know, um, that path, you know, that journey. Um, and one thing that, you know, coming up as you share is, you know, that, that aspect of resilience, you know, that, that aspect of this was the circumstance, but somehow in, in, in one day, one moment, one second, something clicked in you, you know, it could have been the words of many people or, or, or few people, you know, those select few that you mentioned, you know, your grandmother, you know, um, those mentors that you had in the community, you know, um, your girlfriend or, you know, um, or a trend of all of those coming together simultaneously that, you know, ultimately was like, you know, I don't want to be in that, be in the same position. So how do I do better, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. and so forth, you know, so thank you for sharing that. Um, you um, spoke about all this happening around you, you know. Um, I mean, it was regular for, us, for the helicopters to be cruising around. I remember one night, um, one of one of my mom's friends was 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 being um, you know, the cops were after, him. and I remember him knocking on my window, saying, "Jay, Jared, Jared, let me in, let me in," you know. And I didn't know what to do because that was my family, that was my kinfolk, and so I let him in, and I hear the police, you know, sirens coming around, and then they beat on our trailer park door, and they came rushing in. 
and they arrested him. You know, I was 11 years old. I was a child. And that was my kinfolk. And um, so, I, you know, just to paint the picture of what it means, a lot of folks don't understand what it means to be in extreme poverty, to deal with the criminal behavior, the maladaptive responses to survive. You know, this man, he'd had criminal behavior, but he was just trying to survive. He was doing whatever means necessary from his cultural upbringing, from his trauma to be able to survive. And I remember letting him in the house and the cops rushing in. I was in my bunk bed, you know, 10 years old, my goofy hat on and, uh, you know, being arrested. So, you know, just to paint that picture of, you know, these circumstances were out of my control. But as a youth, I just felt this calling. You know, there were pastors, there were teachers, there were community members that believed in me. And that's what genuinely made the difference. I don't mean to interrupt you, Michael, but I just, no. you know, just to, to paint a picture of this, you know, we didn't cook in the kitchen. We cooked out back because it was fire because we didn't have electric. And um, anyways, there was this, there was this just, just calling that there was this need to make change. There were people that were doing things to survive regardless, based on their circumstances. You know, they were doing whatever they could to survive in these situations. Anyways, thank you, Michael. Let, let me interrupt you. Definitely, definitely. Um, no. um so what at, at what age did you get placed with your aunt? You yes, know? I was yeah, yeah. So I was about um I was about 13 years old. And um my mom refers to it as our children didn't get placed, but I chose to go because I went when things were getting really bad. I left. I didn't want to be home. I remember a circumstance where, you know, um, it was my birthday and my mom said that we were going to go shopping. We were going to go buy some shoes, buy some clothes. You know, that's what mattered to me. You know what I mean? Social influence, looking fly. And um, I remember it was on my birthday and I asked her, I said, are we going to go? And she went out to the garage and went out to the, went out to the garage meant that she was going to go partake in methamphetamines and other drugs. And, and then she came in the house and I was sitting on the chair and I was like, when are we going? And she's like, oh, baby, we're not going to go. And I remember getting so upset and she sat on my lap and I remember punching my face because I was so upset that we weren't going to go. And I, I was at that point, I, I'm a bigger dude. So I was about, you know, 11, 12 years old. I stood up and I pushed her off my lap and I went to my room. And I remember feeling that pain and that disappointment that the people that I was supposed to trust to provide for me just weren't going to be there, you know, because there was, there were more, it was more important. They went out to the garage and did their substances. And um, where I found my solace was in school. I went to school and I was seen as a musician. I was seen as a leader. In fact, you know, my friends would call me the preacher's kid because I'd seen the turmoil. I'd seen the negative experiences and I just didn't want that. So when I got to the point where I was about, you know, it was about 12 years old where I did not want to be those of which was before me. I didn't want to continue the generational cycles. I didn't want to continue the generational trauma. I wanted to be something different for my family. And um, I was involved in everything. I was involved in band, choir, football, you name it. I wanted to get into it because I didn't want to go home. Because when I went home, I just experienced those, you know, those traumas, those pains. And so I would do whatever. Now, I was kind of isolated, you know, so I would participate in those activities, but I was on the backside. You know, I didn't want to get too involved. I didn't want people calling on my name because I was worried about the stigma, because if they found out that Jared, who's supposed to be this great person, is also from the block, from the hood, from criminal behavior, from substance abuses, you know, that, that stigma carried around. I, I mean, I remember, you know, like I said, wearing shoes four sizes too big. I remember wearing grandpa clothes. So you know how in, in school and adolescence, kids are mean, man. And um, but but something just held on inside of me. I just wanted to make a difference. You know, there were other children experiencing similar circumstances that I was. And I was the kind of guy that was like, all right, come on, we can do something about this. You can be better. And that just kind of fruition did it in, into adulthood at, you know, youth voice and youth choice. You know, I see all the time where children are, are required to go to therapy. And therapy is a great intervention, but therapy doesn't work for everybody. For some other kids, they need choir. 
They need music. They need sports. They need skydiving to heal their pains. And I was fortunate to be able to try some of those unique interventions to help me heal. Thank you for sharing that. Um, transitioning, you know, uh, because I want to make sure, you know, I, I understand this, this timeline of your life, um, transitioning with your aunt. So was that a change of location? Was that like, a you know, was that in a different city, you know, or what have you? Um, and you spoke about high school, you know, or not high school, but school being a refuge and so forth. So um, walk me through these transitions, you know, um, moving into aunt, you know, um, or being placed with aunt. And then um, if that was, you know, was those relationships still kept like, you know, because uh, I know for some people, they move in with a family member, you know, they still see mom. You know, right, 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 right. right. Much didn't change, you know, and what have you. So, what did that look like for you when you moved in with your aunt, you know, um, and so forth? Yeah, so I'll, I'll share that my auntie, and my uncle, Uncle Johnny, and Aunt Vicky, they were in the same town, and we were my my sister was placed with my grandma, my brother was placed with his grandma because he had a different father, and I was placed with my auntie. Um, and so my auntie, she had an extra room. And I, I will actually, let me rephrase that. I started off on a cot in the kid's bedroom. There was a cot, metal, foam, and I stayed in that bedroom. But they had different resources. They had money. My uncle worked at a mine, a coal mine. And he was able to, you know, he had resources. He was a part of, you know, you know he was in a different place than my, than my mother was. And when I was placed, my mom went to a different city. She was about an hour and a half away at her placement with my brother. My brother went to a short stay with his grandma and then he was able to move in with my auntie. I'm oh, sorry, with my mother. Um, and I was placed, I was sleeping on the cot and eventually got my own room. Um, same city, which required, which allowed me to have those same connections because if I would have been placed in a different city, I would have lost all my people, my friends, my family, these people that genuinely cared about me. But I was able to stay in the same city, continue the same activities, and uh, I think that really helped my growth. I was able to, um, you know, I was involved in all these extracurricular activities. And if I would have been moved to another city, I would have started ground zero. Um, now, they had resources. They had finances. They had food. They weren't worried about paying the house note every month. And so I, it was able to develop this level of security for me that I was able to thrive. I remember my auntie when I was my senior year of high school telling me, hey, do you want a letterman's jacket? I'm like, what? I'm not fortunate enough to grow in a community where it's like that. And she was like, hey, let's let's plan on you getting a job. And she connected with the local pizza factory. And she uh, had a conversation with the owner and they hired me as a dishwasher. And I started dishwashing, you know, and eventually worked my way up, way up to the oven. And I was able to pay for my own letterman's jacket. And then she was able to, she told me whatever I made, she would double that. So I was able to buy my class ring, letterman's jacket. I was able to go to senior night at Disneyland only because she had the resources to be able to sort me. If I was still in my old community, I would have never experienced any of that. So like having those additional resources for my auntie in the same community, same connection to team, you know, those team members, AKA natural supports, people that cared, that applied, you know, their, their themselves for me and had an interest really made the difference. Um, I, I like to think about a lot of our youth that are moved from city to city, from state to state. And you wonder why the, tr the, the trauma of moving from one community to another is extreme. You don't know where to shop at. You don't know the neighborhood. And being able to stay in my own community was a significant part of my development and uh, ability to succeed. Thank you for sharing that. You um, spoke about, you know, so initially, let me backtrack. So initially you went into a kinship situation, you know, and, you know, um, that ended up being a, a successful placement, you know, because you ended up staying there, uh, I'm assuming for the rest of your right. adolescent life, you right. know, um, which is really awesome. Um, so my question to you is now you're replacing somewhat stability, 
when you, you know, because we all have those moments, you know, and I don't want to assume if you did or if you didn't, but, you know, finally realizing, okay, so this is what stable parenting looks like. You know, um, what was your, you know, mental health? What were, you, what was those thoughts in your head when you got to that mo moment of realization that, you know, um, you know, because I, I, I'm just assuming, you know, um, why couldn't my mom or why couldn't my dad do this for me? Yeah, because it seemed, it, it, you know, I, and. and I know we've talked before, but, you know, seeing like very basic things like providing food, providing clothes, you know, providing a safe shelter, you know, and so forth, you know, um, choosing me versus what have you. Um, right. What was that moment for you? What was those thoughts when you got to your aunt's and uncle's place and, you know, they showed stability? Man, that's a, that's kind of a that's a deep question, right? Like. Um, I remember, you know, 9-11 occurred when I was in placement. Mm -hmm. And I remember my auntie running in the room and saying, are you okay? I remember my uncle who was kind of, he was kind of a different kind of dude. He was, he was different. And um, I remember he would do little things like every Sunday he made breakfast, he fried bacon. And so every Sunday you smelt in the whole house bacon and he would make kind of a, you know, a bacon egg scramble. And it started to develop some consistency, some repetition, some consistency for me versus where we lived at before. My mom was just doing whatever she could. My mom had good, you know, had a good heart and was doing whatever she could to survive, including commercial sexual exploitation just to pay the bills. Where, whereas over here, it was just, a, you know, just a given that we were that when I go to the fridge, there was food in the fridge. The water was turned on. She regularly wanted to do the laundry. And I remember this, you know, just this feeling of, of my needs being met. And also, my auntie understood that I had a level of autonomy. I was not a young child. I was becoming a teenager. And so she would do things like support me, like, hey, you got football on Friday night. Do you got to ride home? You know, do you feel like you have, she would make breakfast. I mean, I, it sounds, you know, like just given, but when you grow up in severe poverty where people are just trying to survive, those things are a luxury versus when you enter in, where you're in a secure, loving family home, you know, you have all those things. They just, and so I remember times where it felt weird. I, it felt weird to like, what do you mean you care about? What do you mean you're, you're thinking about, you're going to be my game tonight? Oh, that's cool. I can't wait to see you there. And um, I remember this, this up leave, uh, you know, this, this, uh, let's call it a, uh, you know, just a weight coming off my shoulders because not only was it me, I was the oldest sibling. My brother was 10 years younger than me. And so I remember having a breakdown one point when I was about 10 years old, 11 years old, my brother, my mom was gone on a three day, four day meth bench. And my brother had no food. There was no diapers. There was no milk. And I remember I crawled into a box. <laughs> Keep it real with you, Michael. I crawled into a box and I cried inside this box and I punched on this box until I eventually fell asleep because I had no control. But in my auntie's house, I had control. You know, there were there were their minimal expectations met: food, shelter, security, that I was able to thrive. And and you know, no knock on my parents; they were dealing with their own trauma. You know, generational trauma. It didn't start with them. There were circumstances of which it led them to that. And uh, being able to, to, to have that, that place of peace. I had my own room. I had a TV on the wall. I used to, be able to turn on TV and watch as I wanted. My auntie was invested in the things that I was interested in. And uh, you know that made the world a difference for me. I can only imagine if I was placed into a foster home that did not know me, that did not understand the circumstances of my family lineage, I don't know that it would have gone the same. You know, they may have seen my behaviors of control because I had no control over my life. So I exerted control wherever I could. And fortunately, my auntie was able to allow me to have that control. If I was placed into a foster home, I don't know that I would have had that same level of control 
And I don't know that I would be where I am today, just to keep it real with you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one thing I want to, you know, highlight, you know, as I'm listening to you tell your story, you know, and give us, you know, that insight is you have a unique perspective. Um, in your in your healing process, you know, to just be real with you. Um, and I and I see that within myself, but I know it took me years <laughs> to get yeah. to the place. Um, and um I, I wanna ask, was it always this way, you know, or did it take a while for you to get to this place to be able to give your parents that grace yeah. and see things from that side? see things as though like they were doing their best you know you know um so I, i'm curious you know was that a process for you to get to that place of giving grace you know um and understanding or were you always able to empathize you know in that moment man so so i deal with my my one of my diagnoses is dysthymia for whatever reason, on any given day, I can just be depressed. I can just be, it's hard to get out of bed. And um, and that's always been something for me. That's always been something I dealt with. But I remember my dad came home from prison. He was in prison for 22 years. He'd been in every, every prison in the state of California, except for maybe one or two. And I remember when he came home, he said to me, he said, Jared, he said, why didn't you ever lash out at me? Why didn't you ever get mad at me? And for whatever reason, I just kind of understood, you know, that the, the circumstances we were we were experiencing, they just were what they were. And um, but but again, I experienced this dysthymia, this depression every single day, sometimes. And um, that is something that always has been a part of my story. You know, I I experienced severe uh, obesity. I was up to four hundred pounds at one point. Just to keep it real with you, Michael. Um, I'm now sitting in a right a 250. I was so I've lost about you know 150 pounds, and it was hard for me. And um, so I think that I experienced my pain, my sorrow through somatic symptoms. My mental peace has kind of always been there, but I experienced in my body this pain in my body. I I, I think that I developed a shield around my stomach that helped me you know, manage some of the pains and the sorrows of which I've been through. I remember going to visit my mom in, in, in rehab and it was an hour and a half away. And um, she bought me a guitar and it was like the only money she had, she bought me a hundred dollar guitar. And, you know, it was little things like that that helped me find hope, glimmers of hope. You know, there was opportunities for me to express myself through music, through sports, <laughs> through fashion, right? Um, that helped me lead to my, you know, to, to being somewhat successful. You know, I would be lying to you if I didn't say that I still deal, deal with these circumstances every day. Every day I lay in bed and it's hard for me to get up. Um, but, you know, I was able to find the right people. You know, I talk about my girlfriend. My girlfriend and I have been together since we were, you know, 10, 12 years old. I'm 38 and she's not my wife. We have children, we have family. And I think that it's those outside of the box interventions that work for me. I went to therapy. I went to anger management. I went to, uh, you know, tutoring. And those things were helpful, but they never really influenced who I was. It was those people that took an interest in who I was and cared about what was important to me. I didn't want to go to anger management class. I wanted to go to football practice. And in football practice, they made me the captain of the team, right? They gave me leadership roles. And those things really helped me, you know, overcome some of the circumstances in my life. It, it created a, almost a road that was filled without trauma. You know, I could not control the things that were going on in my life, but I could control what was right in front of me. And um, I found ways to be able to control those things and to be able to manifest, you know, uh, some level of success. But I remember, you know, most kids had their parents show up to their football games. My parents didn't. Most kids got awards, which I did get too. And their parents were there. Mine weren't. And so I remember those moments, you know, of being all alone in those circumstances and feeling like, you know, it, it didn't matter. In fact, I remember one time I, I said I was going to quit football. I said I quit. And one of my coaches came to me and was like, hey, why are you trying to quit? 
And I was like, it doesn't matter. I can play football. I could be all league, all CIF. You know, I could be the main player on the team, but my parents don't see it. And then you know what they did? Let me tell you this, Michael. This is a legit story. Um, we created a play where um, I was able to get through. I was on defense in football, and everybody else took on, you know, the, the offensive line. So I got through the line clean. And I got through the line, line clean, and I smothered that quarterback. And I made play of the week. And guess what? My dad was able to watch that on his four by four clear vision, you know, see through television screen on prison. And I remember I went to visit him and my dad was so excited to see that I had made play of the week. It was hit of the week because I knocked the guy out. Um, and it was those circum, you know, those different interventions that what would work for the normal kid wouldn't work for me. It was different. They created a play where I was able to succeed. And my dad, who was in prison, was able to see me. And that made me feel alive. And that offset of, you know, the, the, the trauma that I'd exposed made me feel so alive. So it was those moments that, that, that really kind of helped me through my depression and helped me through to, to, to make a difference in this world. Definitely. Um, I appreciate you sharing and um, being so open and uh, vulnerable and, and walking us through, you know, your youth. Um, I want to transition into what you do now, you know, why you do it, you know, and, and, and just being, because, you know, from us talking before, I'm very real, you know, very raw and cut, you know, um, I, I have to ask, so, somewhat getting away from this world of trauma, you know, um, why step back into it and work in it? Man. That's a good question. So I originally started working. Well, let me just tell you, I, I was I went I was fortunate. I went to a city college, you know, a community college. And then I signed this contract that said if I if I complete the following conditions, I would be automatically admitted to San Diego State University. And um, so fortunately, EOPS, I forgot what that stands for, extended opportunities for students. They knew that what I've been through. And so there was those additional supports that got me into this program that got me into a real university. And I was able to go to San Diego State. And while I was at San Diego State, I worked on my psychology degree. I started off in criminal law. Eh, it wasn't for me. Um, I got into psychology. It was the right fit. And um, so then at the end of my psychology degree, I applied. I started thinking about I need to get a job. And so I applied for a behavior analytic job, you know, working with different behaviors, and kids that were similar to me, because I felt this calling, like, I can understand what they've been through. You know, I can engage not only through language, through experience, you know, I can connect to those kids. And uh, so I applied for this job. And uh, uh, it was at Fred Fitch Youth Center in San Diego. And uh, I, I was applying and I did the interview and they were like, yeah, so you're not qualified. And it was like, you know, day gummy. And they're like, but there is this role of a youth partner. And I was like, all right, tell me more. And so a youth partner was a child with lived experience who would partner with other children to help them navigate these systems successfully. And so I, you know, obviously I signed on, I was ready to go. I wanted to get my experience. I wanted to give back. I knew that there were people that cared and invested in me and I wanted to do the same. So I started with the interest of like trying to make a difference in this world. And eventually it turned into, I wanted to live a legacy. My grandfather, who was a mayor, who was a fire, firefighter, who made a difference. I, I eventually wanted to be like him, my, my pappy. And so I started as a youth partner and I was permitted, promoted to a parent partner because my brother, when my mom was homeless, who was 10 years younger than me, was placed with me. And uh, we, you know, we did what we could to support him. And then I was, so I was a youth partner and then I was a parent partner. And then I was a facilitator. I didn't have the degrees, but I had the lived experience. And so they hired me to be able to facilitate, you know, teams to help children heal. And then eventually I was promoted to being a fidelity director, which means I was responsible to make sure that everyone that was doing the practice was doing it as it was adhered to design to be done. And um, 
gosh. And then I got hired at the University of California, Davis as a peer with lived experience to help train other folks. And so I would be partnered with a psychologist, a doctor, a licensed clinical therapist with me as a lived experience. And they would provide, you know, a perspective that was more educational, was more professional. And then I would come around and say, hey, did you think about what the kids were eating? Did you think about what they were going through? And there was co this combination of the professional and lived experience that created healing for others. And um, so then I, I, you know, I was able to be a fidelity director over the practice. I was hired at the university. I started teaching this practice across the nation. <laughs> I swear to goodness, just Jared. I'm just Jared. Ain't nothing special about me. But based on my lived experience, I was able to apply, you know, these theoretical concepts to real life. You know, it's like you want to be strength based. OK, here's what it means to be strength based with a family experiencing poverty. Here's what it means to experience be strength based with a family experiencing generational cycles of criminal behavior. Um, and so, yeah, it, it just kind of came came to life. And uh, here we are 20 years later. And um, I'm a national consultant and trainer with four different states, two different uh, countries, uh, helping child welfare and juvenile probation engage youth. Because it doesn't matter the intervention. You could have the greatest intervention in the whole world, the greatest evidence-based practice. But if you can't engage youth that are going through the circumstances and connect to them, it's a waste of time. So I've been able to help agencies, counties, countries, states learn how to authentically engage with youth regardless of their circumstances so uh, i don't know if that answer kind of answers your question but like there was a shift i kind of applied for a job they said no they said we got this other job and then i realized it was my calling i could connect with kids that nobody else could connect with you know there was a kid experiencing um you know uh, a psychotic disorder and i was able to play music that they understood. I was able to speak language that they understood. I was able to relate to circumstances of which they've been through and they understood. So then the intervention, regardless of the practice model, was a better fit because the kids were open to making a change. And um, so it just kind of naturally happened for me. Awesome, awesome. You know, it sounds like you stepped into your purpose, you yeah, know, but... in a way. And it, you know, and it kind of just wraps you up and so forth. So that's that, that's beautiful to hear, you know. Um, as, I'm, as I'm listening to your story and hear all that you have been through and overcome and, and persevere, you know, um, it's, it, 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 it's a lot and you continue through, you know, um, despite the odds. You know, as another person who... Everybody knows about Detroit, you know, um, right. that's where, you know, I was born and raised, you know, um, food deserts, you know, seeing people get beat up because they old the dope dealer was a norm, you know. So coming, you know, from a, a different perspective, you know, of that urban, you know, um, environment, you know, poverty, that that bullying because of what you look like or what you're wearing, you know, and so forth. Um, I can relate to your experience in so many different levels, you know, and all I can do, you know, is commend you, you know, for overcoming that and not, you know, um, keeping that to yourself, you know, paying it forward by sharing what you have, you know, overcome and how you've overcome it to help make it better for others and to help not only the people who live the experience, but help the people who have a more professional um, stake in this game, um, be able to see the impact of lived experience, you know, um, so I, I like to thank you for that, you know, and um, all you've done in that area. I only have a, a couple more questions for you, you know, um, one being, what advice would you like to leave here today? Man, um, you know, our systems are broken. You know, there are these professional systems that have great intention, but they don't understand the travesty, you know, the pain, the circumstances of children and families. And um, although 
the, the best intervention we can have is to partner with families and let children and families identify what their needs are and then meet them. You know, I, I've worked with children and families that, that, you know, they get assigned tutoring or anger management. And what the real reality is that they're hungry or that they're scared. And so through true authentic partnership with families, allowing them to have their voice, their choice over what the service is and the, and the, and the, and the situation is, that's where we make a difference. You know, our systems are so caught up between red tape and bureaucracy and, you know, Medicaid and meeting the, the ethical, you know, obligations that sometimes they just miss families. Sometimes families just need someone to believe in them. Sometimes families need economic and concrete supports. Now think about my grandma. I don't know how she paid the bills. I don't know how she paid for those prison phone calls that cost $20 a pop. But somehow he found a way. And if we were better able to support my grandmother at meeting those economic and concrete supports, how many more of my siblings and my cousins and my aunties would be successful? So sometimes there's bureau bureaucratical you know, issues that get in the way of healing families. And I'll tell you, Rita Pearson is one of my greatest mentors. Check her out on, on, on YouTube. Uh, Rita Pearson says that children and families don't learn from people they don't like. So it doesn't matter your grandiose intervention. You could have the pill that would make a difference in someone's world. But if they don't trust you, if you don't engage with them, if you don't partner with them, it's a waste of time. So ultimately, I think where our children and families would thrive and our systems fail every single day is their own implicit bias their own internal biases and they, they, their judgment of families rather than actually engaging families and understanding what they are, where, where they're at, what they've been through and what will make them better. So I think, I, you know, my, my ultimate two words of, of uh, uh, you know, of all, all my system work has been authentically set with children and families. Listen and then do what they say they need. It doesn't matter your degrees, it doesn't matter your roles. If you would just listen to what children and families say that they need, you might actually make a difference. And so sometimes that, that ask us to act outside of our roles, you know, whether it's money, whether it's safety, whatever it might be, maybe just connection, just to authentically create a relational stance with children and families, regardless of your intervention, create a relationship and authentically get to know them. And you just might help heal their lives. Thank you for that. I um, truly appreciate that. You know, um, I couldn't have said it better. I couldn't have said it better. Um, any last comments? And this is, you know, I know you talked about your TED Talk. So if you got any rap albums, you know, another a TED Talk, anything, you know, how people can follow your work, how people can connect with you, um, feel free to drop that here. Yeah, good looking out. So we've, so, um, I, you know, I worked at the university. I've worked at different agencies across uh, the state of California. And eventually I started my own consulting group. And uh, so we're called the Heroes Initiative. The Heroes Initiative is more of an advanced way of learning and connecting with with staff to help them learn every day. You know, I think that, um, you know, we go through these trainings, we go through these workshops, we go through these keynotes, and we're inspired to make a difference. And then we go back to business as usual. And it's kind of like our brain just kind of whoop goes back to business as usual, doing things, you know, traditional. And, um, you know, the more outside of the box interventions might actually make a difference for children. I worked with a, a great program in San Diego, California. It's called Community Wraparound. And so what we did is we trained a church, a bunch of reformed gangsters. We tra trained the police and the judges all how to engage children. You know, there's criminal behavior. There's lives that have been lost. And a lot of it has to do with the generational cycles. And we trained them what it means to be voice and choice. We train on them what, what it means to employ and, you know, use natural supports because community is ultimately the thing that makes a difference for children and families. 
You know, we could go back to the dawn of time. Tribe up. The more tribe we build around our children and families, the more difference we can make. And I really believe that the, the, the more we can build those folks, the more, the better chances we have to experiencing positive outcomes. So I'll just shout out, you know, I built the Heroes Initiative. Check us out. We've got an app. Um, it's about educating service providers across the country on things like what does it mean to be voice and choice? What does it mean to be individualized? Because every circumstance is different. What happened to you versus what happened to you is different. And the services and systems that will support you are different than the ones that work for you. And, uh, you know, we get caught up in this bureaucracy, this red tape. And, you know, I just imagine if we could authentically partner with children and families we serve and authentically ask them what they need. And then without resolve, go for it, do it. Imagine the circumstances, imagine the outcomes. You know, for me, I needed to feel control over my life. My father was incarcerated. My mother was in and out of rehab. My family experienced severe poverty, poverty and criminal behavior. I just needed someone to throw me a rope and help me dig out of that. And the traditional interventions didn't work. Therapy made me frustrated. You know, anger management made me feel like I was out of control. But there was coaches. There were band directors. There was my girlfriend. There was community members, family, pastors that all found a way to, you know, rise up around me that said, you know, we're not going to let him fail. So I think that the more that we can get outside of the box and build children and families around communities, tribe up, the more success we'll be. And I think our systems sometimes get involved in policy and get involved in, you know, ethics. And, you know, that doesn't always work with this family. So we want to partner with them and ask them what they need and then do it, do it. And uh, so I'll kind of leave it there. The more we can understand our children and families, the more we can create hope and opportunities for them to succeed. Michael, thank you so much for this interview, man. Uh, I know I kind of jambled, rabbled on, but uh, I get excited about this stuff. And I just really think that the more that we partner with children and families, the more they're able to identify what their barriers are. And then we should act on those, man. No, it doesn't matter the financial obligation. You know, it costs $400 to help this kid out with getting involved in sports and get him to cleats. It costs $12,000 to put him in a placement. It's easier to institutionalize children and families than it is to institutionalize new ideas. And that's wrong. That's completely wrong. We would rather lock them up than try something different. And in my world, we try different things. And those different things often lead to great outcomes for children and families. So thank you, Michael, for letting me be a part of your interview and uh, Resilient Voices and Beyond. There are thousands of youth like me. There are thousands of people that are making a difference. And I appreciate you for giving us an opportunity to speak on it. No problem, no problem. The pledge is all mine. I appreciate you taking the time out, you know. Um... We, we we came up in two different eras, you know, of um, foster care, essentially, you know. So um, anytime that I have an opportunity to learn, you know, from, you know, who came before me, and, you know, who's coming after me, you know, I, I'm going to take that, you know. Um, uh, and I think, you know, um, that's one bit of advice I can offer to, you know, advocates, you know, consultants, child welfare workers and so forth out there. You know, never stop learning as long as you're yeah. doing the work, you know, take the opportunities to do so, you know, and this is one way that I continue to learn, continue to evolve, continue to do the work that I do. So thank you for, you know, being open, you know, sharing your experience, you know, not just with myself, but with the audience listening, you know, um, it's truly a privilege, you know, and an honor. Um Guys, this is episode 14, you know, um, I'm hoping to beat, you know, uh, season one, but, you know, I'm going to try to stick to my timeline of ending season two at the end of December, you know, um, it'll be cramming a lot of episodes in <laughs> to try to beat, you know, season one. Um, but I truly appreciate you guys staying here, rocking with me, you know, uh, listening to these individuals who, you know, have experienced, you know, and I've interviewed 
people with lived experience, parent partners, you know, people who have stakes in the game, you know, community leaders and so forth. So, you know, um, I appreciate you guys taking on this journey with me. And um, I realize what I'm doing is stepping outside of my own experience with you guys to be a neutral party, to take a listening ear to all sides in order to get to the same aspect and same goal that we all are trying to reach. It's which, excuse me, to help the children, to help these families, and to do better by people in general. Um, I spoke about in my coffee and conversation about the lack of humanity that is in our health and human services agents, agencies, you know, that's in our policies and legislation that trickles down into state, you know, and local government, you know, we strayed a little bit, and I don't even want to say a little bit, because I feel like this dialing down, we strayed a lot of bit away from the main goal and mission, and um, Jared mentioned that today, you know, um, really, you know, getting outside the box because we've kind of set ourselves in this box that has became a lot dense, you know, um, I get it, you know, I'm never going to tell somebody not to follow what their job is required, but also we have to get to a point where we realize what isn't working, isn't working, yeah. you know, and um, figuring out how to preserve, prevent, you know, and alleviate you know, because if if there is a open door that we can do better as a country and society to provide for our people within this nation and then extend out, because I'm a fair believer, we got to get ourselves together before we try to get somebody else together. And, you know, us as America, that's a whole different episode. We like to go and do something for somebody else when we still, you know, got slavery, all this other stuff happening in our right. own country. You know, so get ourselves together. You know, get get our, get our home, our shop, you know, back together. And then translating those models, those modules, to other people to use, not dictating, you know, but translating those for other people to use, you know, and see if it works for them as well. Um, I'm not going to talk your ear off, you know, this has been a pre pre uh, pleasure. And um, as I always say, you know, we talked about a lot of different things that can be potentially triggering today. I ask that you guys take some time to debrief, do some mindfulness exercises, you know, do some kind of self-care if you felt triggered, you know, and even if you did and you have not done anything like that today, do that today. Basically, taking care of yourself, you know. Um, Jared also mentioned that mental health doesn't always look like you're running a meal therapy. You know, there's so many different avenues to taking on your own mental health. You, you have music therapy, art therapy, you have working out, you have yoga, you have all these different pathways. So, you know, I'm be real. Y'all know I, I like to keep it straight and honest with you. You know, there's no excuse. And we have to put away the excuses, especially how the season can be uh, up and down of emotions for anyone with lived experience, but nonetheless, people in general, you know, you have these up and down experiences of emotions. Some people lost some people, you know, during this time COVID happened you know I started up around this time you know yeah. um holiday season can be a lot a lot of feelings it can be very depressional depression uh situational depression and different things like that please take care of yourself you know let's go um lastly COVID still out there COVID flu season you know take care of yourself you know it takes one of us, you know, to do the right thing, you know, and we're all a part of this big village. So if you feel yourself, you know, not feeling well or what have you, put that mask back on, take care of yourself, you know, because by you doing what you need to do is helping millions. You know? Tribe up. Definitely, definitely. You know, um, this has been episode 14 of Resilient Voices and Beyond season two.
Thank you guys. You have a good night, good morning, good evening, good whenever you're listening to this. Thank you. And thanks, Michael.